there were two dualities that we discussed yesterday. And today we'll uh, discuss a model which uh, includes both of them in some way. So the first, the first duality is between a free photon and a free compact scalar. And I want to elaborate a little bit on the map between the operators in this theory, which I've already mentioned yesterday, but I wanted to do it again for, for, the, for the sake of the review. So the gauge field A uh, has the usual gauge transformations. So A is not a variable. A is not a well-defined variable on this side. Here, phi is not a well-defined variable because it's a compact scalar. But then there are well-defined variables between which there is a well-defined map, uh, which is invariant under these transformations. So the field strength maps to the derivative of the scalar. And if you just dualize this equation, you get this equation, which you can interpret as a mapping between conserved currents. So this is the conserved U1 topological current. And this is the conserved current of the free compact scalar, which is conserved, conserved by the virtue of the equations of motion. And then the, there is the more complicated part of this uh, map, where you start from monopole operators on this side. Monopole operators are hard to define, but they exist in the abstract. And they map to something which is relatively easy to understand on that side. These are just cosines and sines of this compact scalar. You can define monopole operators intrinsically on that side in two ways. One is the OPE way, which is perhaps more appealing to you. So you can just define monopole operators to, to be operators for which if you do the OP with the field strengths, you get this kind of expression. So here there is N coming from the N here. <coughs> and then there is an epsilon tensor where the indices mu and u are to be soaked up by the A, since this is a two form. And then you contract it with an X and divide by X cubed. The physical interpretation of this equation is the following. I just wanted to make this comment. So from this equation, you can get some sort of intuition for how the monopole operators are defined in the pass integral, let's say. So this equation says physically that the field strength that the monopole creates is that of a magnetic monopole. So the canonical way to define a monopole operator if you're a lattice person, say, or if you want to do a pass integral, is to take a point in space, let's say zero. Uh, take a, so this is the point zero in space. You take a small sphere around this point, and you just say that we introduce boundary conditions where the monopole operator is inserted, such that there is a magnetic n units of magnetic flux. n units of Dirac or magnetic flux. So you do it with an infinitesimal sphere. So this is an infinitesimal sphere. And that, why, that is why it defines a local operator in the pass integral. So it's a genuine local operator that you define by uh, extracting a point with a small sphere and defining this magnetic flux. So that's just a formal way to say the same thing. So that's how you could define monopole operators. You have to extract a point, define some boundary, some singularity in the gauge fields, and, and then pass integrate. But anyway, you don't, have to do, you don't have to think about it in this, this way. You can also think about it just as satisfying this abstract OP. It's the same. So that was the first duality that we discussed. Are there any questions about it? Good. Uh, I want to make a par parenthetical comment here that will be very useful as we go on. The comment is that um, the, this model and this model, they have an S1 worth of vacua just because they break spontaneously. You want topological. So when you have a free photon in two plus one dimensions, it breaks spontaneously, you want topological. Or in other words, you can see it in this language very easily. This is just a compact scalar. So this symmetry is spontaneously broken. So this is a comment that I wanted to make. The symmetry that corresponds to d phi or star d a is spontaneously broken. So this, mo this, this free gauge field theory is always in the spontaneously broken phase, the free gauge field theory. When you add matter fields, it may not be in the spontaneously broken phase, but the free gauge field is always in the spontaneously broken phase. And you see it from this description. There is always like a, a, a circle of vacua. So the, the charge that corresponds to this, the charge that corresponds to this current 
is uh, spontaneously broken. <coughs> uh, that's comment number one. And therefore, you can extract uh, from, this from this fact that the order parameter is e to the i phi. We see that e to the i phi in the scalar language has a web, right? Because phi uh, is some number between 0 and 2 pi. So e to the i phi is some number. And therefore, also the monopole condenses. So m1 is the same as e to the i phi. And it's always non-zero. Integral of star to phi. That's correct. I was hoping somebody. Very good. So the charge is spontaneously broken, and the monopoles are condensed. So you have to remember that a free gauge field in 2 plus 1 dimensions has condens condensed monopoles, and therefore the topological U1 symmetry is spontaneously broken. And that's how you see from the point of view of the gauge field that you have a circle of vacua. You have to notice that there is a U1 symmetry. The monopoles condense, and therefore there is a circle of vacua. That's uh, the first thing I wanted to mention. That's the correct way of thinking about this model. Uh, the other thing is that this model is free, but I could add on both sides uh, monopole operators. So on this side, I would just add plus m1, plus m2, ta 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 ta, plus complex conjugate. And on this side, I would add cosines and sines. So once you add cosines and sines on a, in a model where there is a circle of vacua, then you lift the degeneracy, and maybe you have a few minima, depending on the cosines and sines that you add. So the way to lift the degeneracy on the gauge field side is to add monopoles. The way to lift the degeneracy on this side is to add cosines and sines. OK? And then you can make the photon massive. So the non-intuitive thing here is that there is a way in 2 plus 1 dimensions to make the photon massive without Higgs fields. What you do is you add monopoles. It's obvious from this description. If you added cosines and sines, there would be maybe a minimum, and there would be some potential, and there would be a mass. So the spectrum would be uh, consisting just of massive particles. And the same is true on that side by this duality. So we can get, give a photon a mass. This is another comment. So we can make A massive. We can make the gauge field A massive by adding monopole operators. By instead of studying the A squared, we can add M1 plus M1 bar, for example. If we just add M1 plus M1 bar, then the photon becomes massive. Should I start from the beginning? OK. OK, so this is very, very surprising. You can give a photon a mass by adding some local operators, gauge invariant local operators to the action. And it's very easy to understand in this description. This will be very important. I want also to say that once you do that, then you break the U1T symmetry explicitly, because you've added operators that have charge 1. So the monopoles uh, are no longer order, good order parameters for anything, because the model doesn't have a symmetry anymore. It may have some discrete symmetry, uh, which is just complex conjugation, like charge conjugation. But it doesn't have a continuous symmetry anymore. OK? So this is the, 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 this is the duality between a scalar and a gauge field. And this is a more complicated version, a much more interesting version, because it's interacting. No, oh, I'm running out of chalk. So the, the other, so the other model has a gauge field and a charge scalar. The charge of the scalar is one. And so when I write d a phi, what I mean is just uh, the usual derivative plus a acting on phi. So thank you so much. So it has charge one. And then we have a quartic potential for just, you know, just to stabilize this model and a kinetic term for the gauge field. And that's supposed to be dual just to the O2 Lagrangian. So here the field is not charged, it's just a complex field. So it's dual to the O2 Lagrangian. And we can add a, a mass term on both sides. If we add the mass term here with a positive sign, we'll have to add it here with a negative sign. We've discussed that yesterday. So the Polyakov, this is called the Polyakov model or the Polyakov phase. So the Polyakov phase here corresponds to uh, symmetry breaking, the symmetry breaking phase of the O2 model. And here I elaborated the map. So we have a conserved current on this side. That's uh, the same conserved current as there. It's conserved by Bianchi's identity. And here that corresponds just to the standard O2 current. 
This is the standard SO2 current of the O2 model. Monopole operators on this side correspond to these uh, guys on that side. How do you see that? They carry the same charge. This is charge under SO2, this is charge under U1 topological, so they map to each other. And you can map all the phases, you can add monopole operators here if you want, <coughs> breaking the symmetry to some discrete subgroup. You can add these guys on this side, breaking the symmetry to some discrete subgroup. And all the phases work, and they flow to the same fixed point. So the, when I, uh, this arrow, what it means, is that these two Lagrangians both flow to the O2 Wilson-Fisher fixed point. Okay, and because that is because of that, they also have the same deformations. So these are this is the map between the deformations, and you can see that everything matches. And this was proven. Okay, this is proven. Say again. How do you find this? Ah, uh, okay. So, so we don't have the full map. This is not the full map. This is just you know the beginning of the map, right? Because both are quantum filters with an infinite set of operators. We don't have the full map. Nobody knows the full map. But these parts are easy. Why? This is a relevant perturbation. Sorry. Let's start from here. This is a relevant perturbation of the Wilson-Fisher O2 model. If you add it, you know what happens. Either the model is disordered in the you know. A high temperature, the phase of the ferromagnet, or it's condensed and then O2 is broken to SO2, yeah, to, to nothing, to Z2. Uh, and so here, you just do a semi-classical analysis and you see the same thing. If you add it with a positive mass, you integrate it out, you have a free photon, a free photon is the same as a circle, and it breaks to U1 spontaneously. So you get this, I mean here, the minus sign is the important thing. It's a qualitative map. This is just the map of the symmetries. That's easy. This is the conserved current on this side, so this is the conserved current on this side. You can check that it's conserved as usual. And this just follows from the fact that these operators carry charge n. And also these operators carry charge n. So I just wrote the map. I mean, it, you could maybe multiply it by phi squared. You know, if Somebody could say, oh, that's not true. You need to multiply by phi squared for n equals 10. I couldn't rule it out. Because this map is just symmetry based. Okay. In particular, as you know, in the O2 model, for low values of n, this is relevant. For example, for n equals 1, this is a relevant perturbation of the O2 model. That implies that the monopole operator with n equals 1 is a relevant perturbation at the fixed point in this description. So these are completely different degrees of freedom, completely different models. They flow to the same fixed point, and it's proven. This is called duality. This is the first instance. Uh, this is also duality. This is a trivial duality, because it's a duality between three fields. This is a non-trivial duality. So this is a non let me just add that for a non-trivial duality. OK? Is the dictionary and dynamics of both of these models OK? Because now we're going to do something more interesting. I'm going to complicate it a little bit so that we could yeah. Uh, what do you know about the vicinity of the fixed point? You said something about some deformations being not so identical. Yeah, so these two models flow to the same fixed point. So when I write these maps, so first of all, when I write this arrow, what does it mean? I don't mean that these are the same models. So if you did U perturbation theory around the ultraviolet, they're obviously very different. This is a scalar field, and this has a gauge field plus scalar. So they're not the same. But they flow to the same fixed point. And since they flow to the same fixed point, you can also do some deformation here in the UV. You add, just you, just some add, you add some operator in the UV. So that maps to some you know, deformation of the infrared. And you do some deformation here, and that maps to some other deformation of the infrared. So when I write these arrows, that's what it means. That the adding this to the Lagrangian, let's say, in the UV would map to adding this Lagran operator in this Lagrangian. So they map to the same deformations of the fixed point. That's the subtle meaning of these arrows. That, they, that these deformations just map to each other. Is that both Peskin and Dasgupta No, Peskin and Dasgupta and Halprin conjecture that based on the fact that this is true. The arguments for this duality in originally were just those. That the phases agree and there is a map. And then it was proven. 
by a lattice, by, lattice com by, la by an explicit lattice uh, transformation. They conjecture that they flow to the same. They conjecture that they flow to the same fixed point, and the evidence for that first you count which deformations exist here. You count the deformations here, and you see that they seem to agree nicely. This is this map. The symmetries agree nicely. The phases agree. So you make a conjecture that it works. You cannot make any statements about this matrix. Oh, uh, the S matrix is probably this completely different. In particular, at very high energies, the models are completely different. There is no statement that the S matrix is the same. The statement is that they flow to the same fixed point, they have the same deformations. This is called an infrared, the infrared duality. That's why people sometimes call these things infrared dualities. These are not full dualities. These are infrared dualities. OK? Very good. So, Hello. yeah. Say again. The form of the monopole operator. So the statement is that if you add a monopole operator here, yeah. it's the same as adding uh, this operator here. Let me just give you a quick explanation, more or less why. So if you have a monopole operator, op monopole operator here, what does it do? In the phase where it flows to a free photon, namely with a positive mass, it would give some cosine potential on the circle. So it lifts the circle. This does the same thing. The O2 model has a phase where you know, O2 is, SO2 is broken. There is a circle of vacua. And this gives them cosine. So they, seem, they do the same thing. Also, they have the same charge under the U1 symmetries of this model, so it's natural to conjecture this rough map, this uh, qualitative map. No, what you said, uh, they are proved by some lattice transformation. This, model, this duality is proven. Yeah. It's proven that this model flows to the O2 fixed point. Yeah. It's proven. No, uh, no, my question is how explicit this proof is. That I don't know. Uh, you're asking if the proof is really mathematically, I think the proof is mathematically precise. I think the proof is mathematically precise. But we're going to uh, assume that this is true for all matter and purposes. Okay, any more questions about this before we go on? Yeah. To the photon. Uh, yeah, for the photon. Yeah. I, I, like if I instead a local operator and I, I reinterpret that as adding something to the Lagrangian lattice, is that? Okay. Can you repeat that? I don't know what the question is. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what the statement was and then I'm just going to make some statements and maybe it will answer the question. So we start from this model. And what I claim is that this model is the same as the free scalar. It mon monopoles condense. And um, there is a circle of vacua. And now we want to analyze what happens if we just decided to add a monopole operator. OK? So we're studying this Lagrangian. Is that what you want okay, to do? So you're, you are integrating over M1 and M2 or M1 and M2? No, no, I'm not. What do you mean integrating? This is the action. Yeah. It is some function of the gauge field A, okay, even though this is not a very obvious function. This means that you've inserted some singularity and then you put it in the exponent. This is very non-obvious, this kind of deformation, OK? And the claim is that what this does is to give the photon a mass. And instead of having a circle of vacua, you have like one minimum. And there is a potential. So the photon is massive, and there is one minimum. And this model has no interesting symmetries other than some charge conjugation symmetry. And how do you see that? It's very hard in these variables. It's, in principle, possible using this equation. You could try to do some sort of perturbation theory and resum it using this fundamental equation. And you, tr you could try to derive it. But a much nicer way to do it is to switch to the dual variables, where this is just a cosine. So you just compute some, pot you know, it's like cosine, um, a compact scalar with a cosine potential. It's like a sine Gordon model or something. So this is the statement. The the fact that the monopoles make the photon massive, I believe, is a Polyakov's re result or idea from the 70s. I believe he was the first to realize that. And this is sometimes called proliferation of monopoles, because you insert them to the action rather than just compute their correlation functions. So here you would say that monopoles have condensed. 
This is what happens if you don't add them to the Lagrangian. But if you add them to the Lagrangian, you say that they proliferated. That's some terminology that's very common in the literature. So you have to distinguish between condensed and proliferated. If they've proliferated, it doesn't make much sense to talk about condensation anymore because the symmetry is broken. So it's a little bit ambiguous. But you can talk about condensation as long as the symmetry is there. OK, so this finishes uh, the review of yesterday. Are there any more questions? I'm not going to rush, so even if I have to give up on one of the other topics, I'll probably give up on it happily. Yeah. Yeah. Are, yeah. No, no, you have to tune. It's called dimension one, right? Both models have one relevant symmetry invariant operator. You have to tune it, and then they flow to the same fixed point, and, the fixed po and they both have the same deformations. So it's a, it's a question about, yeah, this, 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 uh, this kind of uh, writing, of course, hides uh, the fact that we need to tune some relevant operator. But the tuning is non universal, it depends on how you, do, how you implement the RG. So this is uh, just saying that the fixed points are the same. That these variables and these variables flow to the same fixed point if you appropriately tune the parameters. OK, that's the statement here. Any final questions about this? OK, so now we're going to move on. I'm going to discuss a model uh, which uh, would reproduce the NLVBS phases. And I, there is, there's a few extremely surprising and physically non-trivial things about it, which I'll try to emphasize. And I'll also mention some very interesting theorem about why these models exist. So the model is a very similar to that side of the blackboard. So we start from this. So the idea here is the following. Uh, there was some Z4 that was broken in the VBS phase. So you just conjecture that in the continuum it's gonna become U1. And so we know how to break U1, it's dead. But that's dual also to this guy. And then you start from this side of the equation and you add something. So what we're going to add is that we're going to have two charged scalars rather than one, as simple as that. So the only thing I'm going to do is to have two charged scalars rather than one. So d a phi i squared plus, now I need to add the quartic interaction and I also, I'm going to write the mass term explicitly. So it's phi i squared, and we sum from one to two. And there will be this quartic interaction, which is important for the stability of the model. Okay, so I'm adding this nice quartic interaction and the usual kinetic term for the photon. That's the model. The claim, this is the claim, and I'm going to argue that this is true by analyzing the phases, symmetries, all this stuff. Uh, and you'll see that, and, and then we'll discuss the physics. So the claim is that this is in the same universality class as the nail VBS transition. So, so the same universality class as this model. So it's like Q, so it's like scalar QED with two charged particles. <coughs> scalar QED in two plus one dimensions with two charged particles. <coughs> okay, so this is the claim. And so now we'll try to justify this claim by first looking at the symmetries. We'll check all the, all the items on our list, symmetries, phases, and all of these things. So let's start from the symmetries. Uh, so I want some audience participation. <laughs> what, is the, what are the symmetries of this model? Just feel free to say um, whatever you think. What? You have two complex scalars, very good. So you would think that there, are, there is an SO4. So in, in fact, this is SO4 invariant. So it's very, very good. This is also SO4 invariant, but the gauging, okay? There is a gauge field. So the gauging breaks SO4. So what remains of SO4? What happens if you have two complex charged particles? What is the symmetry? <coughs> 
Say again. Somebody. Global, global symmetries, yeah. There is a U1 gauge symmetry, but we don't count it. One of the nice things about this duality is that it shows that gauge symmetry is not fundamental. There was a gauge symmetry on one side, but it is a, there wasn't any gauge symmetry on the other side, but they're the same. A gauge symmetry doesn't count. So what happens if you have two complex charge scalars? What is the symmetry? So it should be some subgroup of SO4. SU2, very good. So we have an SU2, which all it does is that it rotates phi 1 and phi 2. We have two complex charge scalars, phi 1 and phi 2, and they're a doublet of SU2. We're, we're soon going to make it precise. This is not completely correct yet. So we have phi 1 and phi 2 are a doublet. The symmetry seems to be SU2, but there is another symmetry. What is the other symmetry? This is a symmetry. What about this guy? OK. This is also a symmetry. So we have a U1, which is generated by star dA. And the charge of the operators are monopoles. We haven't added any monopoles, but they exist, and they carry the U1 topological charge. So if you uh, just look at it naively, it seems that the symmetry is U1 times SU2. That's not quite right, because the nil VBS ha phase had SO2 times SO3, not SU2. SO3 and SU2 are not quite the same. And indeed, the symmetry here is not SU2. The symmetry here is SO3. Let me explain that. That's a very important point uh, about CFTs and QFT in general. The symmetry, of, the symmetry of QFT, what is the symmetry? The symmetry of quantum field theory is uh, the symmetry of QFT, which is some group G, is, is faithfully, faithfully acting, and this is important, faithfully acting on the space of local operators. That's what we call a symmetry in QFT. This is, G is the symmetry that gives rise to word identities. It's the faithfully acting symmetry in the space of local operators, OX. So in this model, well, it seems that there is a doublet of charged scalar fields and they transform under SU2. If you actually write down the space of local operators, you would not count phi 1 and phi 2 as, as good local operators because they're not gauge neutral. The space of local operators are the gauge neutral ones. The ones that are not gauge neutral need to be attached to a Wilson line, so they're not local. So if you actually wrote the space of local gauge invariant operators, then you would have things like phi i, phi j star. This is already gauge invariant, right? Or you could have made power, like derivatives and so on and so forth. And this space does not transform faithfully under SU2 because the center of SU2 never acts. You only get representations which are odd dimensional of under SU2. So this, is a, this could be in a triplet or a singlet. But there, there is never a spinner representation of SU2 in the space of local operators. So therefore, the symmetry is actually SL3 times U1 topological, which is the same as SL3 times SO2. Is this a subtle difference clear? No. What, what about for something like a scattering amplitude? So uh, the existence or non-existence of scattering amplitude depends on the existence or non-existence of um, you know, asymptotic particles. Uh, while the symmetries of quantum field theory are well defined in compact space, we don't need to ever discuss what happens at infinity. When we discuss quantum field theory, we imagine that the space is a compact manifold. That's the best setting, where everything is well defined. We don't need to discuss boundary conditions. So we discuss the space of uh, some compact space and time. Then we write down all the possible local operators. And we ask in which representation do they transform faithfully. This is the set of symmetries that we have in the problem. And that's the set of symmetries that generate word identities for correlation functions of local operators, right? When we study correlation functions of local operators. Yeah, yeah that's the set of observed. Scattering amplitudes have to do with infinity, and they may transform under symmetries that are much more subtle. As you know, there is an ongoing discussion about what is the exact symmetries that act on the S matrix, because it has to do with boundary conditions. And it's not universal. It depends if the model confines or it's not confined, as you know. The questions about infinity are very subtle, but the questions about the symmetries of quantum field theory are completely clear. It's the symmetry that acts on the space of local operators, or on the projective Hilbert space. It's the same.
the projective Hilbert space and the space of local operators are uh, transformed under this faithfully under the same symmetry. So if you want to ask what symmetry generates word identities, it's not SU2, it's SO3. There are no word identities for the center of SU2, it's trivial. So that's the actual symmetry of the model. Is that clear? Or not so much? But this is extremely important because I'm going to claim that this model is the same as NAIL VBS and NAIL did not have SU2, it was SO3. So this point is very important. If you did not have a photon, this model would have a SO4, SO4, okay? SO4, because you would lose this guy. So the photon actually doesn't kill symmetries in two plus one, the photon gives symmetries. It doesn't just kill symmetries, it also gives a symmetry. So if you remove the photon, this would be dead, this would be gone, and that would be replaced by SO4, okay? So it's not, so this group is actually, I mean, not n less nice than the group that you get without the photon. The photon in two plus one always gives a new symmetry. It j doesn't just kill symmetries. There is a question if SO3, uh, the fact that it's SO3 versus SU2 shows up in local physics. So I don't know what you mean by show up, but the, the space of local operators transforms under SO3. I mean, if you just write down the space of local operators, you have a vector of SO3, a tensor of SO3. Why would you ever say that the symmetry is SU2? The, the center of SU2 doesn't show up in local physics. So it's the opposite. I mean, you could say it's SU2, but the space of local operators doesn't transform faithfully. But it's like saying that you have a let's say you could have a QFT without any symmetries, and you could say that the symmetry is SU100, which doesn't act. It, you know, it's not very useful to add stuff that doesn't act on anything. Okay. So, so the symmetries, we understand the symmetries. Now we can ask about the formations. So the idea is that this flows to some fixed point, perhaps. We're going to discuss how to prove that using the bootstrap. But the idea is that this model flows to some fixed point. And we know the symmetries of this fixed point. It has to be at least that. It could be bigger, but it has to be at least SO3 times SO2. And now I would like to explore the formations of the fixed point, which correspond to the formations of the ultraviolet theory by the usual dictionary of Wilson. So we're going to so if, the idea is that if we tune the mass, we flow to some fixed point. Now let's see what happens as we vary the mass. So we're doing this usual semi-classical computations where we're going to take m squared to be very, very large and positive. So mu much bigger than anything so that we can do a semi-classical analysis. And again, let's do some audience participation. What happens if I add a huge positive mass for the scalars? Huge positive mass. What happens to the theory? Hmm? Great, so we just have a photon. So the effective field theory is just this. We have, I didn't add monopoles to the, uh, to the Lagrangian. If I added monopoles, I would have a photon plus monopole operators. But I didn't do that yet. I want to preserve the maximal possible symmetry. So I have that. What does this do? It breaks spontaneously which of the two symmetries? We had SO3 times SO2. What does this break? Hmm? SO2, right. So SO3 is intact. SO2 is broken spontaneously. Right, so we have a circle of vacua. <clears throat> Let's do the other phase. This is much more interesting. Let's say that M squared is huge and negative. So minus M squared is bigger than anything. So I'll do the analysis here for you. It's a little bit more complicated. So then the scalar particles want to condense, right? So we have a potential that looks like minus m squared, phi squared. So this is just a shorthand notation for the sum over phi one squared plus phi two squared. So we have this kind of potential. And uh, m squared is huge, so they want to condense. 
So how do we, so we want, we want to find the minimum of this potential, right? They want to condense, so we have something like a Mexican head. So we have something like uh, this kind of thing, but it's multidimensional. So we have some potential like this, like a Mexican head type of potential. So we need to understand, uh, first let's ignore the gauge field and understand what do we get. So when they condense, then the sum over, the sum over phi i squared uh, would be some constant, right? They condense, you ignore the gauge field, we solve the equations of motion, we get this kind of space. They just condensed, and this is what this circle is supposed to describe. What is this space? Second? S3, very good. But we should not ignore the gauge field. So some of these configurations are gauge identified, right? Or in, one, in other words, one of these configurations, one of these guys should be eaten by the gauge field, right? It's a Higgs mechanism. We have S3 wars of Goldstone bosons, but one of them has to be eaten. So we have to divide it by U1 because of gauge ID. What is this space? So we have to divide by U1 both spaces. What is this space? Does anybody know? S2, not a circle, S2. This is three dimensional, this is one dimensional, so you get two a two dimensional space. This is called the Hopf, Hopf uh, vibration. You can read about it. So if you just look at this space of points and you identify all the points that differ by a phase, right? The gauge symmetry takes phi one and phi two to phi one and phi two times a phase. So you just identify these points on S3 and it kills one of the compact directions of S3 and you get an S2. So now we can draw the phase diagram. You see that it beautifully matches the lattice. The, the sort almost matches what we wanted from the lattice except that we had a Z4. So let's draw the phase diagram. So the phase diagram here, this is M squared. So there is some Maybe some fixed point here. We don't know, so let's just put a circle and a question mark. We don't know what happens in the middle. For huge positive M squared, we concluded that uh, there is an S1 Goldstone boson. And for huge negative M squared, we have an S2. So here SO3 is broken to SO2. And uh, SO2 is intact. And here SO3 is intact. SO3 is intact, and SO2 is broken to nothing. So here there is monopole condensation, as always in the Polyakov phase. And here there is a condensation of what? Of phi's, right? So here there is a condensation of phi, phi dagger, sorry, phi, phi star, with indices i and j which are in the triplet. So if we want to make these indices be in the triplet, uh, we have to symmetrize over them. So plus i, j. So here there is a condensation of this guy. The triplet of SO3. When the triplet of SO3 condenses, SO3 breaks to SO2. It's like you have a vector. A triplet of SO3 is like a vector. So if you choose a vector in space, it breaks SO3 to SO2. That's exactly what we've seen here. Yeah, it's the same. So this, the symmetry breaking here is just choosing the vector in three-dimensional space. It's like choosing, it's like a, the vector representation of SO3 gets a wave. And here, you just have something that has charge one under SO2, but neutral under SO3 that gets a wave. So these are the two symmetry breaking patterns. Are there a condensation of, of charged particles or a condensation of monopoles? And there is some phase transition in the middle. Now, this almost describes what we talked about yesterday, except that yesterday this phase had only a Z4, right? We had SO3 times Z4. Z4 was broken here, and, S and we had an S2 on this side. So to fix that little, uh, little insufficiency in this model, we simply had a monopole operators that have four units of charge. That's what is believed the nail VBS lattice does. So it preserves a Z4 symmetry out of SO2 
that we add out of the SO2 that we've had here. Maybe I'll put a T on this SO2, not to confuse it with the unbroken SO2 in the nail phase. So if you just add monopole operators, which are in units, four units of monopole operators, monopole operators with four units of charge, then Z4 is still preserved because this is like a cosine of four, five. If you have a cosine with uh, four, then you still have a Z4 symmetry. So here Z4 would be broken, and here the Z4 wouldn't play any role because you have a condensation of charged particles, it's a Higgs phase, these monopole operators don't do much. Yeah, you have to, of course you have to put some scale depending on where it comes from. So in the condensed matter construction, these monopole operators are generated by some lattice. In high energy physics, we could embed this model in SU2, SUN, so you have to put some scale depending on where you how this came, how this came to be generated. We don't know the UV, we just say that this exists. They're dangerously irrelevant operators in the language of renormalization group. We just add them, they don't do much, except that the S1 is now uh, just four points. So instead of S1, we just have four points because, because we have cosine of uh, four phi, right, by this uh, duality. And so the S1 is replaced by Z4 and we have four vacua. But the, for the sake of high energy physics, we really don't want to do that, right? I mean, this, on the, this depends very strongly on the lattice construction. Maybe some other lattice only generates, uh, generates monopoles mod eight or monopoles mod two, we don't care. So we don't need to do that. We can just think about the most symmetric situation where the symmetry is SO3 times SO2. So you don't have to do that. I'm just saying that this is what the lattice does and that's how we match with the lattice phases. A what? Say again. Is there is this kind of reasoning in derivation of the fact that the fixed point has to be actually symmetric because it's a very good one? Yes. Uh, at the, so if you look at condensed matter literature, what they would say is that the monopoles become kind of insignificant near the transition, and at the transition you expect to recover SO3 times SO2. So even if you add these guys, you still expect the transition would have an enhanced symmetry. But for our purposes, we, don't, we really don't want to do that. I mean, we want to have the most symmetric phases, and there is no reason to add these monopole operators. It's just believed that this is what the lattice does. Now, this has a, this has a conceptual point which is extremely interesting. There is a conceptual point here that is extremely, extremely interesting, and it's, ex and it's also very general. And let me explain this point. So you remember where the lattice had uh, a Z4 times SO3. But where did that Z4 come from on the lattice? It didn't act on the, on the spin. It was embedded in what? In the space-time, right? On the lattice, this was part of the space-time symmetry of the lattice. And now we said something that looks at first sight insane. We're embedding the Z4 inside SO2 topological. And SO2 topological is a perfectly good unitary global symmetry. It's non-space-time, okay? This looks insane, uh, but that's what we've done, right? We said that lattice symmetry, lattice symmetry in the continuum, sorry, lattice symmetry in the continuum gets embedded into a global symmetry, global non-space-time symmetry. And this looks bizarre. So the Z4 symmetry of the lattice turned out to be embedded in the monopole quantum numbers, which is a good global symmetry. And in fact, this does gupta peskin halperin duality shows that this is as good as any other symmetry. It's not that it's because it's a monopole symmetry, so it's special, no. You saw that the duality could map, the duality of peskin does gupta halperin maps this SO2 of the monopole to a standard SO2 symmetry that acts on the O2 model. So there's nothing special about this symmetry. The fact that lattice symmetries get embedded into global symmetries is very deep. And it's, in fact, you can make it into a theorem. So I want to offer a theorem. It's not gonna be phrased very precisely mathematically, but it's correct uh, if phrased appropriately. So I want to phrase something. Suppose you have a model where, okay, suppose you have a model where all the lattice, suppose you have a QFT, with a symmetry G, okay? 
And the symmetry G arose from some lattice construction in which G was not a space-time symmetry. So G arose from some lattice where G was completely embedded on site. So we call it on site. From some lattice where G is on site. What does it mean on site? It means that it does not involve lattice space-time symmetries. So this is what the on site uh, terminology means. So the G symmetry was completely visible on one site. You didn't have to, you didn't have to involve lattice rotations or the lattice translations. Suppose this is true. For example, this is true for all the ginsburg landau constructions of spins and magnets. Then there is a theorem. Suppose this is true, theorem. The, this quantum filter has no anomalies. So this kind of constructions would never give a system with anomalies. And, and no obstruction, no obstruction to, get <clears throat> to have a disordered phase. So the fact that these models have no disordered phase is very intimately linked with the fact that some of the symmetries in the lattice construction were not on site. They were space-time symmetries. And you could make it into a theorem that you cannot construct interesting quantum filters, interesting, I mean, that have anomalies, by starting from lattice, symmetry, from lattice systems where all the symmetries are visible on site. What is the outline of the proof? This is for the advanced students or maybe uh, the researchers. Hmm? Yeah, this is an outline of the proof for the advanced. Uh, most of you might not be able to understand it. The proof is that if, imagine some lattice model where the symmetry G is on site. So you see the full symmetry G by the spins that sit on one side. Then you could gauge the symmetry G by adding classical gauge fields, by just adding links. Standard Wilson links, uh, holonomies in G. So if all the symmetries G are on site, there is no obstruction on the lattice to adding classical background fields G, which are holonomies on, and then you can gauge G. If you can gauge G, it means that there is no anomaly. So therefore, it's very important that some of these elements of G are not on site, so you could not gauge them. If you cannot gauge them, there is a potential for an anomaly. So this is the proof of this direction. The other direction is very hard. It could be that you have a lattice construction where the symmetries are not on site, but it still does not lead to an anomalous theory. Only this direction is obvious. The other direction may not be true. OK, this is just an, this is just an explanation for why. I, so for the students who cannot follow that, I just, just have to keep in mind that this fact is not an accident. It's a very deep fact that is necessary for this picture that doesn't have disordered phases. OK. That's right. That's right. So the Z4, some part of the lattice symmetry group gets embedded into an internal symmetry group in the continuum. But if it's internal on the right hand side, then the location of operator is social. Right no, because the quantum filter is only valid, you know, near this fixed point. I mean, the quantum filter description is not is some approximation, which is valid at long distances. But it is guaranteed to have this group, the symmetry group of the lattice, at least. It might have more symmetry. No, it, it, sort of. You could say that locality on the lattice is completely lost because it's like this, at the this scale lambda, there is some approximate locality, maybe. But so it is like the lattice scale. So it's a very, I think it's a very good point uh, to try to understand how that comes about. But all I'm saying is that this is absolutely necessary to get non-trivial QFTs. You cannot hope to get non-trivial QFTs from spin systems like Honsager's uh, or any of these magnets that Lando and friends studied. OK, so I want to talk about the bootstrap now. Uh, this model turns out to have a discrete anomaly. So there is a Z2 anomaly between SO3 times SO2. Where was that? So this system has an SO3 times SO2 symmetry. It's a bosonic model in two plus one dimensions. And in spite of that, there is a Z2 at hoofed anomaly. I'm not going to explain that. And using that anomaly, one can prove in the continuum without referring to the lattice that there cannot be a disordered phase. So we have a continuum proof. You don't need to rely on the lattice. Similarly, if you study the anomaly polynomial carefully, you can prove that there's the, 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 the intersection of two domain walls in the VBS phase 
So we have this domain wall, this domain wall, this domain wall, and this domain wall. If you make them intersect, you have a spin a half representation that is exactly located at the intersection. So it's a projective representation. You'll find the projective representation at the intersection. So that reproduces all these lattice results that I mentioned previously. So we can reproduce all the lattice results in the continuum. We can prove that there is no disordered phase. We can prove that there is a spin a half representation at the intersection of domain walls. Uh, the only thing that is interesting that remains, and it's open for many years, is uh, the question of whether there, there is a fixed point here. Can you can you prove the actual Yeah, so we can discuss it now. I want to discuss it now. All the ways in which we could make progress on this problem. The most interesting open problem in this field for 10 years uh, is to understand if this transition is second order or first order. So I just want to make some suggestions now of how the bootstrap might come into play. <coughs> This is uh, based on a taxi discussion with Leonardo yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reference. <laughs> OK. So I just want to make a few suggestions uh, for how uh, the experts here might be able to uh, shed light on this problem. So obviously, this fixed point has some symmetry G. So G is the symmetry of this fixed point. G is the symmetry of the fixed point. And obviously, G is going to contain SO3 times SO2. And maybe it's just exactly SO3 times SO2. In fact, if you also count discrete symmetries, there is another Z2. I'm not going to discuss Z2. This Z2, it's not going to be very important. But there is another Z2. Maybe we should add it for the good taste. There is a Z2, which is in a semi-direct product, charge conjugation. It may not be necess necessary. OK, so we're looking for some fixed point with SO3 times SO2 symmetry. And I think it would be good to do it step by step. Z2 is like charge conjugation. I didn't even discuss it very much. Uh, it, if you start from this Lagrangian, it acts by taking a to minus a and phi to phi star. And it's actually unbroken in both phases. It's a homework exercise. You can try to prove it. Charge conjugation is unbroken in both phases. So uh, when you take a semi-direct product of Z2 with SO3 times SO2, what you get is O2 times SO3. That's the actual symmetry group, OK? And the Z2 is unbroken. Because uh, <coughs> because uh, if you do this thing, then monopole, the monopole Mn becomes M minus N. Because if you change like the sign of electric fields, then N units of flux become minus N units of flux. So it has to be a semi-direct product with the SO2, and therefore, why, therefore it becomes O2. OK? It's like a reflection on the SO2. On the SO3, it doesn't do anything. And this Z2 is unbroken, in bo in, in, in both in the nail and also in the VBS. So it, it's not very important. The broken things are the SO3 and the SO2, respectively. So the first step is let's assume that G is really just SO3 times O2. Let's assume that this is true. <coughs> uh, then we expect that this model, in addition to the obvious currents for SO3 and, SO and SO2, this model would have one relevant operator, one relevant operator, which is a singlet of G. So we know that there is at least one relevant operator, which is a singlet of G. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I'm saying that this, um, <coughs> we could add monopole operators here. And then these two phases would become Z4 and S2. But for the sake of discussing the fixed points, we don't need that because these monopoles become irrelevant near the fixed point. So they modify the phases that you see semi-classically, but they become irrelevant at the fixed point. So we can forget about them. And we can, from the beginning, throw them away or take the cutoff to infinity. We can just imagine that the cutoff is infinity, throw them away. And we have 
I mean, the fixed point is going to be at least SL3 times SL2 symmetric. Monopoles with four units of flux are irrelevant at this fixed point, if this fixed point exists. OK? So we can, from the beginning, just throw them away. Um, we can look, OK, so. Yeah. Correct in case to naive, but it looks to me like before the usual one now Ginsburg, we had masters and everything goes to zero. Now yeah. it's still true, but post that we get photons. And then photons turn out that in two plus one they are non trivial and they break some SO2. Exactly. So that's basically that's the all, that's the idea. So then at least you need an SO2 from the photons, right? So yes. And now if you had a bunch of photons, you have a bunch of SO2. So yes. That's, that's correct. The reason that this model. Uh, so, for example, in higher dimensions, a priori, there is no obvious counterpart of this. Oh, there is. Oh, there is. There is. It's not, co it's not coming from photons. It may come from somewhere else. But I can give you tons of examples which uh, exhibit similar phenomena that you cannot deform them to trivial phases. So, so here it comes from different right? dynamics. In four dimensions, roughly speaking, it comes from theta terms. Theta terms can hold the order intact, that you won't be able to destroy it. In three dimensions, it's photons. In four dimensions, it's theta terms. There could be various sources for this phenomenon. But here you're right. If you're just a semi-classical person and you want to do S matrix, S matrix or something, then what you would say is indeed what you just said, that this model looks very much like the O2 model, except that there is a photon in one of the phases, and therefore there is a Goldstone boson. But that point of view is a little bit, uh, I think, it misses the interesting stuff, which is that you can actually prove that uh, you cannot disorder the model even in the quantum like regime where the masses are small. So it, there is really an anomaly in this model that protects the phases. It's not so easy to kill this anomaly. OK. So we know that this model has to have one relevant operator, which is a singlet of G. Uh, and what is this operator? It's m squared, no? It's, it's just m squared. Uh, this operator m squared that moves us between these two phases is going to be a singlet of the representation. Uh, and it's z2 even, right? It's z2 even. So a singlet of g, in particular, it's z2 even. Uh, and it moves us between these phases. And we expect it to be relevant. Another operator that we expect to exist is uh, so phi phi star. So we expect this operator, which is uh, an SO3 triplet. So this is an SO3 triplet uh, and SO2 singlet. We expect this operator to be relevant. And lastly, there is the monopole operator M1, which is actually an SO3 singlet, and it has charge 1 under SO2. So it has charge 1. So we expect these operators to be relevant. Now, what, about, what happens if we add this to the Lagrangian? It's an interesting story. If we add m1 to the Lagrangian, this phase disappears. So it kills the anomaly. We've broken the symmetries too much. It kills the anomaly. Uh, and actually, this uh, transition becomes the O3 Wilson Fisher point. So we expect that if we add to this fixed point, this putative fixed point, if we add m1 plus m1 bar, we expect that it would flow to the O3 Wilson Fisher transition. This is not very helpful to do bootstrap, but it's an interesting fact. That it kills the anomaly, and then you can go to a disordered phase. It sort of destroys all the lattice symmetries. So in the context of that theorem that some lattice symmetries get embedded into internal symmetries, uh, this model would break all the lattice symmetries, and uh, there won't be anything interesting left. Because the Z4 is broken completely now. You embedded a single monopole. So for that reason, we expect M1 to be relevant. We expect that it would trigger that flow. It's a statement. It's not, uh, it's not obvious. I'm just saying that uh, if you add m1, this becomes disordered, and this is an s2. And this looks very much like the phase diagram of the O3 Wilson Fisher point. This is point number one. Point number two, this model has no anomalies, because there is a disordered phase, and we've destroyed all the lattice symmetries. So it's very likely that it flows to the O3 Wilson Fisher fixed point. This is, it's a very, it's, it seems very likely. I don't know how to prove it. And there is some lattice evidence for that. So there is some lattice evidence that this is true. 
people just add, people just destroy the symmetries on the lattice. They see where you flow, and there seems to be the all three Wilson Fisher fixed point. So that suggests very strongly that if you took the field theory at this fixed point, which may or may not exist, it would flow to the all three Wilson Fisher point. It's just a statement that may or may not be true, but it's supported by lattice evidence. And it's not very important anyway. So these are the operators that are expected to exist. And yeah, so one observation here that we discussed yesterday with Leonardo is that in Wilson Fisher fixed points with these symmetries, there would be at least two relevant operators, which are singlets of G. There would be the order parameter of SO3 and the order parameter of SO2. So any kind of you know, Wilson Fisher like description with this symmetry, you'd expect it to have at least two relevant operators, which are singlets. Here there's only one, and this seems to be key for the fact that you don't have a disordered phase because there is only one relevant operator rather than two relevant operators that preserve the symmetries. So it would be nice to see if such a fixed point exists. If one could rule it out, it would be very nice. If what could rule it, one could rule it in, it would be even nicer. So it's a win-win. Yeah, they haven't converged. They don't know. People, have, people are still struggling with the lattice simulations of that model. And the exponents have not converged, so we don't know if the transition is second order or first order. But the bootstrap is ideally suited to answer this question. So unlike, any, unlike the free field theory with these symmetries, or unlike Wilson Fisher fixed points with this symmetry, we want only one, relative, one, one relevant operator, which is a singlet, not two. And that seems to be a key distinction. Well, what, the, reason that, the reason that it's one now is that if you look at this Lagrangian and you ask which operators preserve all the symmetries and they seem to do something, so they're relevant. So it's just the mask word. If you change the mask word, you go from this phase to this phase. You don't, I don't know of any other interesting operator here that does anything interesting. So it seems like there is one. In the Wilson Fisher description or in free field theory, imagine doing something like starting from O5 Wilson Fisher and breaking the symmetry to SO3 times O2 by adding some ugly interactions. You would have two, two, kinds, of, uh, two kinds of order parameters because there, you started from five fields, right? Phi 2 to Phi 5. You started from O5 and then you added some ugly interactions. And they, let's say, preserve SO2 times SO3. So then the square of this guy is invariant, and the square of this guy is invariant. So you have two relevant operators, which are singlets of SO5. And intuitively, that's the reason why there is a disordered phase, because you can add this with a huge coefficient and add this with a huge coefficient. And here there is only one, and this seems to be a key distinction. OK? I don't know if this is right. This is just a suggestion. Yeah, you could, we could discuss that. Mm, so you're asking what about operators that are bifundamentals? Uh, well, here you can construct such operators. You can like take a monopole and multiply it by some phi's. I don't know if it does anything interesting. It seems not to. So maybe you can impose another condition that there are no relevant operators which are in the bifundamental. Yeah, maybe this is a good condition to impose. But maybe those are enough. Maybe those conditions are already enough. OK. Uh, this is the end of the discussion of 2 plus 1. And now I want to start the discussion of constructions of fixed points in four dimensions, a la Banks and Zucks. Uh, are there any questions about 2 plus 1? Yes. No, this is, this is the homework exercise for you. I don't know what to do. But I'm told that these kind of questions are very natural for bootstrap. If you know like, or more or less what you expect to be the spectrum of low-lying operators, it should be enough to start the bootstrap for this kind of theory. 
maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I'm told. That you know, imposing the number of relevant operators is a very strong constraint on the bootstrap. Anybody wants to comment on that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the bootstrap, for, for example, can rule out the theory where the symmetry is Z2 and there are no relevant operators. You can presumably rule it out. And that sounds not too far. I mean, it's a statement of the same sort. Yeah. You don't have too much time. I don't know if you have a Oh, I went or oh. What time is it? Oh, that's that's right. I forgot. I thought it's two hours. No, one hour. At most fifteen minutes. I don't know. Okay, so now I have to take questions, right? Yeah, I think it's better. Uh, start a new topic now. Five minutes away. Okay. So, are there any questions about two plus one? About the lattice, I can I can explain a little bit more this theorem on the lattice if you want. Yeah. Internal symmetries. Can you determine ahead of time which one becomes the over symmetry? Okay, I don't know. There is a, I don't know, no. There is a question of, like, given a lattice model, you have lattice symmetries and you have uh, uh, internal symmetries, like on-site symmetries, and you can ask if there is a QFT description. QFT's description QFT descriptions don't always exist. They exist when the lattice, at some, you know, in some range of parameters, has long-range correlations. So let's suppose that such a point exists, and you can ask in the QFT description which symmetries should be part of the QFT internal symmetry group, and which symmetries should be space-time. So you can ask if lattice symmetries are embedded in the internal group. I don't know of a general prescription that answers the question positively or negatively. In this particular example, the way you do it is that you observe that uh, when Q over J, Q and J that I defined in the previous lecture, are very large, you see that there are four ground states, and they're related by lattice transformations. So if there is any sensible QFT description, which doesn't break space-time symmetry spontaneously, you know, QFT could also break sp space-time symmetry spontaneously, but it's not likely. The more likely thing is that this Z4 is part of the internal group. And I don't, it's very, very circumstantial, and it's very indirect. I don't know of a general prescription. For example, in Ising magnet, or uniaxial magnets, or Heisenberg chains, it, it never happens. Uh, this is a particularity of this example, but it's also clear that this particularity is extremely important. This is why this model is non-trivial, because of this theorem that I mentioned. So you have to look for such models if you want to generate interesting models. Any other questions about anything that was discussed in the... Say again? That's right. However, Silvio has this other way of doing epsilon expansion where you do an epsilon expansion like on some, you know, you should break the space-time symmetries. You imagine that it's like S2 times hyperbolic space of dimension two minus epsilon, and then it would still be part of, I mean, you could still construct monopoles. But you're right, in, in the epsilon expansion, the U1 topological symmetry would be gone. But you could still try to do some computations for anomalous dimensions in the epsilon expansion. And it, I don't think it was uh, studied very much. And I also don't think it would be conclusive. So it might not be worthwhile, I don't know. Any more <laughs> questions about anything that regarded the two plus one I story? Have many, many questions. When you say lattice symmetries, you mean lattice like symmetries of the ground state, right? Not no, 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 no. The model that we wrote on the lattice has lattice symmetries meaning that it's invariant under various lattice symmetries, like translations, uh, rotations by 90 degrees. The model itself, the Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian on the lattice was invariant under lots of symmetries. One of them what was a translation by one lattice unit. One of them, another one was a rotation by 90 degrees. And these symmetries turned out to be spontaneously broken in the VBS phase. However, the way we capture that phenomenon in quantum field theory is that we embed this Z4 subgroup <coughs> into the U1 topological symmetry. And the breaking of U1 topological is what reproduces the breaking of that lattice symmetry. Spontaneous breaking, I should say. I, think I was thinking about something simpler, like if I go the other direction and say, like, take the 
lattice as an approximation to uh, continuous QCD or something. Try the QCD on the lattice. Okay. So then you can imagine taking different lattices to study. Ah, that's great. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll give you an answer to this question, which is uh, I think it's, it makes contact with what you said. The question is what, how does, uh, the question was uh, about QCD, right? How, about lattice constructions in QCD and how space-time symmetries play a role. So you've probably heard that uh, it's extremely hard to implement massless fermions on the lattice. Yes. Did you hear this claim ever made? What is the reason? Suppose it was easy. So the symmetries could be on site. Then, there could be, then it would contradict the theorem that I mentioned, that there is no mixed anomaly between axial and vector symmetries. So massless QCD has an anomaly involving the U, U SUNF axial and SUNF vector. It's not very precise what I said, but there is a mixed anomaly between some vector symmetries and axial symmetries in QCD. From the theorem that I mentioned, it immediately follows that there is no lattice construction where the symmetries are on site. If there was such a lattice construction, there wouldn't be an anomaly. So that explains why it's very hard to implement massless fermions on the lattice. So one thing you may want to do is to embed the axial symmetry in a space-time symmetry. And this is, I think, in some in indirect way, the approaches that people have taken to implementing massless fermions on the lattice, like these five-dimensional brains, is in some way uh, like what I said, but it doesn't seem very obvious. But I think this is the root of the problem. The reason it's hard to implement massless fermions on the lattice is be exactly because there is an anomaly. So if there is an anomaly, there is no way to implement it on site. OK? Any other questions? Yeah, you can study supersymmetric versions of this theory. In fact, this, uh, if you supersymmetrize this model, you get the simplest version of mirror symmetry, like n equals 4. If you make it into n equals 4 in three dimensions, you get u1 plus scalars, u1 plus hypermultiplets. u1 plus hypermultiplets is a version of, I mean, it's like mirror symmetry. It's the simplest version of mirror symmetry, and it's dual to some quiver theory. And I believe the same Z2 anomaly is present, actually. I haven't checked that, but I think it's true. I think that uh, there is this mirror symmetry examples have a similar Z2 anomaly. And it could be interesting for something. Maybe you could try to derive the Z2 anomaly from string constructions, from the Taub nut. I don't think people have done that, but I think it's true that there is such an anomaly and it may be possible to derive from string constructions. That may be a good exercise to try. But uh, and in, the, in the mirror symmetry case, in the supersymmetry case, it's known that this flows to fixed points. We have lots of lots of indirect checks that indeed it flows to a fixed point. If you just study U1 plus hypermultiplets with n equals 4 supersymmetry, we know that it flows to a nice fixed point. We know a lot about this fixed point. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. 